Yep, it's gone live. Excellent. Um, now I just need to. Okay. So, and when um, when we've switched off everybody's video, would you change the view so that we only see the people whose video are live? Because I don't know how to do that. <laughs> no problem. Thanks. Thank you, everybody who's joined. We'll just wait a few minutes. Um, and in the meantime, I'll just put some music on. It better be good, Joe. Okay. <laughs> Joe, mm -hmm. I as I uh, hang on, I just let me see. Uh, no, as co host, it's not letting me take everybody off. I can talk you through how to do that, but it seems that it will only let the person again. Okay, where has, do I do that? Right, if you go on to manage participants, so the participants at the bottom, if you click on. Mm -hmm. Manage participants. We'll come up with a list of 29 participants so far. Mm -hmm. Right. If you go, it should give you an option to mute all, unmute all, and then three dots. I don't have three dots. It says more. All oh, right, more, yeah. Yeah. So on the more, on the drop down menu, it should give you an option to hide everybody without a live feed. No. Without not showing video. No. Does it do that? No. Not uh, available. <coughs> oh. Uh, let's try here. More. Remember, we will be fluent in this in five years' time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> um. Hello. Yeah, it's Hi. not. Uh, Hi. <laughs> it's not a lang. Hi. Welcome. Yeah, I think I need to change my camera. <laughs> Jerry, it's Mark Spellman, if you can hear me. Yes. Hi. Welcome. Thank you. Hang on. The good thing is, Jerry. Sorry. Alexander, yes. you called me? Hello? Hello? Okay. Joe? Hmm. The good thing is, I don't know if you can see what we're seeing, what everybody else should be seeing is what you're seeing um, as the host. We're seeing, it says you are viewing Joe's screen. Um, so what we're seeing is everybody's seeing the slide and on the side, thumbnails yeah. and only the people who Talking. have their 
video switched on are um, are in the thumbnails. Okay. So, although it then, although it does come up with names far 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 below that, nobody, the, the ones that you see on your screen are only the people who have videos switched on. Okay, that's fine. That's what everybody else is seeing as well. I'm just, it should be. Okay. We'll give this one more minute and then we'll start, I think. Okay. Let's start. <clears throat> Welcome, everybody. <clears throat> uh, thanks for joining. I'm just trying to work out whether we have all our panelists uh, on board. I believe we do. Um, oops. Alexander. Hello. Let's see, Alexander's trying to call, but I think he should be, uh, he should be on. Mm, no, we're missing Alexander. Uh, oh, here he is, good. Um, I think we've got all the panelists on, so that's good. So I think we can start. Uh, thank you all for joining. Um, I hope what which I hope will be a very um, stimulating, interesting session, hopefully with lots of um, debate and agreement and disagreement. So let's see if we can push for that. Um, I'm going to start. I note that um, there are quite a few people that we know uh, as Radix and uh, quite a few people that we don't know. So you're Let's see. Um, excuse me one moment. Um, uh, Leon, could you um, just say a few words of introduction while I uh, respond yeah, to Alexander? So, of course. Uh, so hello, everybody. Uh, it's a real pleasure to, to be moderating this, this discussion. Uh, we have um, four out, uh, five outstanding speakers. Um, and uh, I'm an academic. I'm a, a research group leader at the Max Planck Institute for the Sa Study of Societies. Um, so again, my name is Leon Wansleben. And um, so as, as, as a way of introduction, I, I was supposed to say a few words on the idea of uh, responsible capitalism and how it fares uh, in the current uh, crisis. Um, as you might, as you might know, the idea of responsible capitalism got a major boost last summer when the uh, American Business Roundtable, for the first time in its history, turned away from shareholder orientation to endorse a, a stakeholder approach. And uh, in its statement, uh, US corporate leaders, all the big US major US uh, company leaders stated uh, the idea of this approach by saying that the purpose of corporations was to generate jobs, good jobs, strong and sustainable economy, innovation, a healthy environment and economic opportunities for all. And that uh, each stakeholder should be essential for the corporation, not just the, uh, the shareholders. And um, um, this, this statement of course is, is uh, part of a broader movement and part of a broader context where I think uh, what is particularly important is the uh, activism of institutional investors and asset managers who have been pushing for uh, introducing criteria associated with environmental, social and governance uh, in the assessment of uh, their holdings. And that has been, I think, a major factor in also leading to this particular uh, business roundtable statement. Uh, and we've seen similar developments in Europe. Um, 
major business representatives have been stating that rather than pushing for lower taxes in the European Union environment, they would rather want to protect and promote the Europe's, Europe's unique model of social democratic uh, uh, economy. Uh, so, so there seems to be kind of a very strong movement now with various, uh, and I couldn't mention them all, various uh, subgroups pushing towards what could be called overall responsible capitalism. But today, of course, the conditions are rather different from uh, last summer when this statement by business leaders was, was issued. We have a kind of combination of supply and demand shocks in the economy that only rival uh, other pandemics or uh, war wars. Um, and the very same companies that have been committing to good jobs and social responsibility are now in the position of making decisions on laying off personnel, uh, such as US car manufacturers or other major uh, corporations, um, which I mean, in, in some, in, in, in result, translates into a major rise in unemployment, much worse than we had during the world financial crisis uh, about 10 years ago, when at its peak, the unemployment rate was at 10%. Now the estimate is we are somewhere in the US at 16% uh, and maybe at 10% uh, in a year's time in, in US, US unemployment. And the European situation doesn't look much better, as you might have read, the European Commission expects a drop in output of uh, more than seven, almost 8%, and only a kind of slow or weak recovery next year of uh, about 6%. Uh, and one should add, and this is of course another topic of Radix, that we are heading towards a major, uh, other major sovereign debt crisis. So that's the kind of context uh, that we are facing, roughly uh, speaking. And it is in this context that we want to ask the question uh, about the future of response, the idea of responsible capitalism and the various uh, actions and initiatives associated uh, with it. Does it have a future in a world where we have a new virus that will probably stay with us for a while and which has ma major influences on political, economic and social life? Uh, in the kind of, uh, advertisement of this event, we, we kind of offer two possibilities that might result from, from this event. One could be that uh, companies need to refocus on the bottom line, reduce expenditures and initiatives to fulfill corporate responsibility, and thereby kind of turn back to a probably a, a concept of, uh, of, of, of corporate activity more uh, closer to the shareholder conception that uh, the business roundtable rejected last year. But there might also be the possibility that the crisis is a window of opportunity uh, to boost uh, kind of transformations that we associate with responsible capitalism. After all, it seems clear that the issue of resilience and systemic risk has become much more important that corporations need to account for and reckon with a more unstable environment in which they have to make contributions to stabilize their own contexts of, of activities. Uh, and that might mean also strengthening the uh, social uh, communities around them uh, so that there might also be an opportunity here in this crisis. And this is the kind of questions we want to pose to our panel. But before I turn to our speakers, I might quickly give back to Joe who wants to introduce, I think, some, some housekeeping rules for the uh, upcoming session. Thanks very much, uh, Leon. Thanks for that introduction and uh, uh, filling the time while I was struggling with the technology. Uh, so uh, why are we at Radix interested in this topic? And um, I'd like, there are some, quite a few people here that we haven't come across before so I'd like to say a little bit about us um, as, a, uh, as a company, as, as, as a think tank. Um, this, um, this particular event is organized by a new center that we've recently launched based out of the Netherlands called the Radix Center for Business, Politics and Society. And our aim is to align public policy with responsible business. 
Um, as always, business moves faster than public policy. And um, a lot of companies that are trying to be have a more of a stakeholder approach find themselves at a bit of a disadvantage sometimes because public policy is years behind. So our aim is to try and align that. But Radix as a think tank was founded uh, four years ago in London as a think tank for the Radical Center. And we're a little bit different from other think tanks in that we're not really interested in tweaks to the current system. We believe that our current post-war system might have served us well, but it's running out of the road. So we're interested in issues that can drive systemic change. Uh, we also have a youth wing. So any of you on this um, call that are between the ages of 16 and 25, I would uh, encourage to look at uh, our youth wing Politica, or if you have children who are interested in public policy issues, um, then uh, Politica is our youth wing, uh, which is very interesting, was set up by Piers Birmingham when he was 16 years old. Um, getting back to the, uh, and we're a network organization. We don't have a bunch of um, researchers doing things. We rather serve as a platform for people like yourself. If you have something to say or some ideas you want to share, then we would like to help you uh, develop and share them. So please do get in touch. Um, just some housekeeping rules about how this event will work. Uh, please, I would ask you to keep your Zoom screens on mute throughout unless you're one of the panelists or are speaking at the time. Um, obviously, the panelists need to unmute when they're speaking or not speaking. I would, we would ask you to submit your questions or comments using the chat function, sending your comments to everybody. And um, Leon will be constantly reviewing the chat and I will be helping him in that and put your questions and comments to the panel. For those of you watching on the Facebook live feed, uh, please post your questions or comments in the comments section there and Annie will kindly feed them through to the chat so that we can um, uh, feed them in to the panel. Uh, Leon's already given his introduction. Uh, he'll introduce the panelists and ask them, and then we'll have a moderated discussion uh, based on your questions and comments. Uh, we'll start the session, I hope, with a couple of short polls that we'll repeat at the end of the session. Um, I won't share the results of the first poll immediately uh, so as not to influence your what, how you might respond second time round. Uh, but let's see whether anybody changes their mind from the start to the end. Um, and we'll share the results at the end of the session. Just so that everybody knows, this session is being recorded. And I would ask, uh, if possible, uh, anybody who's not a panelist, if you could also turn off your video feed, that would be helpful. Uh, it would save bandwidth and would make the feed on Facebook uh, a little bit more uh, visible. Uh, so that's those are the house. Uh, that's that's how the session will run. I'll now try to see whether um, the polling actually works. No. Yeah, there we go. Can you guys see the poll? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Sorry. Great. All right, shall I take over, John? Oh, hang on a minute. There's Cut. still people responding. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good, people should have stopped responding. I'm gonna end that poll. Um, and then I'd like to 
Let's ask you another question. Very good. I'll stop that now and hand back over to Leon to launch the discussion. Okay, uh, many, many thanks, Joe. Uh, so we got a group of five very distinguished speakers with uh, strong profiles in uh, business, investment, uh, and politics policy making. And each, the, the idea is that each speaker gets five four to five minutes to, to make an initial statement. And then we'll have plenty of time, hopefully, for uh, Q&A um, left. And I'll, I'll introduce each speaker just before I'll give him or her uh, the word. Um, so our first um, speaker is uh, Petri, Petri Hofste. Um, and uh, Petri is uh, in the boards of so many companies, I couldn't possibly mention them all here because uh, we would run out of time. But to make it brief, I should just mention that she has a major role as chairperson of the sub supervisory board of uh, Acmea Bank. And she is uh, a member uh, of the board of Rabobank and has a role uh, as managing director of the pension fund Zorg uh, and Velsein. Uh, she has also major experience uh, as uh, deputy uh, CFO at ABM AMRO, and so so she and and in her various roles, she's she's worked for companies that are very committed to um, environmental, social, and governance issues, uh, as well as those that perhaps are less so. And so this very broad experience gives us the opportunity to ask her what her perception and her assessment is of how the corporate world. Uh, response to COVID-19 uh, with regards to these uh, issues of uh, ESG, that is environmental, social and governance. Petri? Uh... I've unmuted. Thank you, Leon. Um, and thank you for the nice introduction with a slight mix up here and there um, with another person that I know very well, but uh, um, so I could figure out who, who that was. Uh, but as, that is not uh, not a problem for now. I'm very delighted to uh, to speak here and honored as well uh, to speak to such a, a wonderful uh, audience tonight. Uh, with hopefully again, like uh, last week, uh, I was in the session of Radix last week. Uh, again, a good discussion. Um, First, a few, a few comments um, uh, from my side. As you said, uh, uh, how do I see the businesses that I'm involved in and that I hear of through my network uh, respond to the crisis? And there's clearly a variety. Um, there's not a variety in the first response, response. So the first response that I've seen with all of the companies that I work with and with what I hear around, uh, uh, in particular the Netherlands, that's what I must, must admit is my... Uh, uh, most important uh, background at the moment um, is that the first concern is with the well-being, the health of people. Uh, so that was the first priority that, that I saw everywhere, which is already critical and important in the topic that we're dealing with, because it's one of the important stakeholders not being shareholders. Uh, and then, of course, second come business continuity. How can we, uh, in a lockdown situation, remotely uh, continue our business uh, and where remotely is not possible how can we do that in a healthy a secure way for those people that need to continue um, and and there I was surprised um, with the speed uh, and the creativity and the agility with which both people and organizations responded um, then next of course also the business impact um, the, the whole chain of suppliers to customers. Uh, where is the impact? Do I get my supplies? Can I actually produce? Uh, and um, 
are the clients able to take my products? Will they take my products, uh, uh, et cetera? And then the financial impact, of course, with all of the macroeconomic scenarios developing again and again in the past few weeks, I've seen more scenarios in a few weeks than I've seen in a whole year, uh, basically, and coming from everywhere, uh, all of the companies doing in, in that respect what they need to do. Um, then um, what is interesting uh, actually is that some of the companies that I see and that I work with also have um, as part of their crisis management organization deliberately uh, already put in place a work stream that deals with the stakeholder community and deals with the sort of stakeholders of the company as well as the community. Um, and, and from the start initiatives that, uh, that relate to uh, the, 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 the community that they work in, as well as uh, looking into healthcare issues and trying to, to su supply people into um, hospitals, etc. So uh, quite a number of initiatives um, that I've seen with, with, with a number of companies. However, interestingly enough, some companies already have immediately, uh, as part of their work stream, started to think of what does this do to our stakeholders, our broader stakeholders and the broader community. Then um, what are the key positives that I've seen from, um, from what is, is developing at the moment? Um, the level of communication to stakeholders, but in particular, the level of communication to employees, to staff, to manager, from management to staff, from staff to manager, has gone up tremendously. Um, and, and, and it's interesting that every meeting actually in the past week started with, how are you doing? Are you healthy? And are you doing okay? And I think that's that's, that's very good and, good and a positive and a positive that the communication level between people and between a variety of people is increasing is good. Then the resilience of people in a way, not their financial resilience and not the financial resilience of companies so as, as much as there is resilience in, in the response, in the quickness of the response and in it, that's the other thing, the creativity of the response as well as uh, the, the, the way in which a number of the developments that have that have maybe already started are now being sped up, spe speeding up, uh, and uh, in particular around digitalization, a lot is happening. Um, but clearly, not also positives. What I also see is exhaustion um, with with continuous crisis management, with continuous being in meetings like the ones we're having now, which are far more intense and far more. Um, energy taking then well this will bring energy but it is also draining in terms of uh, uh, energy in another way as well so the always on um, uh, burnout risk that we have that we are seeing and actually that will have an impact in society uh, having to be always on uh, no work-life balance because that is all the same that is all in the same room all in the same house that you're that you're in um, I think will have, and uh, an, an in particular if this continues, uh, an impact on individuals as well as on society. So what do I see as emerging lessons? I already mentioned, and you mentioned, Leon, as well, the resilience. Um, I expect and see an emphasis on the resilience both of individual people uh, and then the individuals that is on their financial level, but also on the level of um, interest in education, interest in wanting to change, interest in uh, needing to change and needing and requiring education. And then on the organization level, similarly, uh, a, higher a higher interest and emphasis on the resilience, on the solvency, on the financial side of the organization, as well as uh, on risk management and governance. Basically, in a, in a way, what we've seen uh, post-financial crisis, last crisis, in the financial services industry, um, where that was more emphasized, I expect that to be broader throughout. Then um, trust, interesting. interestingly, what we see is that with people working remotely, uh, it requires a lot of trust. Of, uh, uh, you need to trust people. You need to trust people to do the right thing. You need to trust people to work, to work in teams and to, to actually work, do their jobs. Um, and it's interesting how, how you see that in, in that way that we just need to have a higher level of trust 
um, uh, uh, rather than having tight controls of being continuously present and, and seeing and wanting to see everything. Uh, of course, with data developing, we, data developments, we, we can do a lot of um, um, working, working around controls as well. However, trust, I think, is key, and it's key also to, to see how we can preserve that. Um, so what, what I think on the, on the organizational level, um, uh, I, I see as a, as a, red, as a threat through, through the, the, the organizations is that to the extent and how the crisis is addressed basically and to, the, and, and, and to which, which extent these companies continue to be a responsible company depends very much on actually the values and the purposes that were present already when the companies went into the crisis. So the example of the company that has from the start a working team on um, stakeholder management on what can we do for and should we do for the community, of course was a company where ESG were responsible business was already uh, uh, important. Clearly there's another side. Leon, you mentioned it, there is another side. If you're in a survival mode, then there's only one thing that matters for being able to be there tomorrow, and that is having sufficient uh, financial means. So having cash, having liquidity. Um, and with that emphasis on, on cash, on liquidity, um, I also see that as a result of that, there is a risk, and I see the risks happening of short-termism, clear. Um, and, and I think that is where, and where spending cuts are needed, there people laying off people will happen. It is going to happen. It depends also on the, on the depth and on the length of this crisis, very much the extent to which we will see this happening. Um, and, uh, and I think that is also where um, the investor community plays a very critical role and also who the investors are going to be. Um, and let me try to, to come to an end and then maybe we'll pick up on a few other things later on. But I think here the investor community is key and what the investor communities that provide the financing and the means to the companies that are in financial difficulty, um, what they are demanding. Um, and, uh, and there, of course, it is very, it's going to be very critical whether the rescuers of a company in temporary stress situations are going to be private equity firms uh, looking for short-term profits or whether they're going to be responsible investors or whether they're going to be governments with uh, bailing out um, uh, in, in certain sectors and having a clear view and a good vision on, on what uh, and how they would like that company to, to develop. I think there's a lot more to say about that and probably that will come up later in the discussion. Uh, let, me, um, let me finish off by saying that, uh, that I, I, I think very much that it is um, important, well, that, that, that of course very much depends on the length and the depth of the crisis that we're facing. Um, and, and whether or not after the lockdown that is easing up here and there, we will see a second wave, um, hopefully not, but that, that of course is critical on, on where we will end. And I find it very important that we do have a view and that there is a vision of how to recover, how to recover our businesses, because with that view and with that view um, being based on on the on the on on what on what all stakeholders need, um, in 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 that we determine the steps in the companies, the steps that we're taking now to move towards the recovery. Many many thanks, uh, Petri. That was a very substantive uh, res uh, response uh, that we can work with. And apologies for the misinformation that I somewhat collected on the internet. Uh, maybe we can correct that uh, later on. Anyways, let's move on. So we have a, a very interesting second speaker. Ryan Gallard uh, uh, has been serving as Patagonia's general manager for Europe, Middle East and Africa for a, about six years. Uh, and uh, as, as most of you know, Patagonia is known for its commitment for protecting the environment and has advanced a very distinctive kind of co corporate 
political activism as Trump himself had to experience at several points in the last years. And um, at the same time, I guess Patagonia is one of those companies that are certainly hit by the crisis uh, in the sense that when shops close, uh, when shops close, people can't buy possibly uh, uh, Patagonia uh, uh, um, clothes. And so my question is really to, to, to Ryan, uh, how Patagonia internally discusses its response to the crisis, but also how it envisions its role uh, going forward uh, with, re with regards to uh, responsible capitalism. Ryan? Yeah, thank you, Leon, for the question. And um, just, I, I don't presume that uh, everybody or maybe even most people are, are deeply familiar with Patagonia. Leon, I think you made all the key important points. Perhaps I'll just add a few, few quick ones. We're privately held, we're a US-based company, 47 year history. Last year, well north of a billion dollars in revenue. And I think now to pick up maybe an answer to your question, start to answer your question. You know, the, the current pandemic has had a profound impact on Patagonia's revenue. Um, I don't know where we will finish this year, but I know definitively it will be as a smaller business than we finished last year. And even in that environment, um, I think that because we, you know, our mission statement is we're in business to save our home planet. And that's not a marketing tagline. That's really why we're in business. Our ambition is to be in business 100 years from now on a living planet with healthy customers. And, and so we're, we are trying to our very best to think very long term. And in this current environment, you know, we have to deal with um, all of the same economic realities and pressures that other businesses are experiencing. And so I think to your question of how do we balance these things and what's the plan forward, I think how we balance them is a real deep commitment to the things that um, stack up to allow us to feel like we're making some small modest contribution to the overall health of the planet. Um, environmental activism is a recent addition to that, but for our 47 year history, we've tried to minimize our own footprint, scale solutions that we find, support activists working on behalf of clean air, clean water, clean soil, and the protection of wild places. And particularly given the overall degradation of the health of the planet, combined with politics in America and avowed climate denier in the, in the White House, we have felt the need to step more overtly into activism. And so I think the intersection of those values and a declining size of business means that we have to make some, have some really tough conversations about of all the things we do, what are the most foundational? How do we distill down and focus on those? But at the end of that, how do we double down on those things and ensure that we don't just remain committed, but that we're accelerating our commitment to these things at a time when we feel that's really needed. And so that's, that's the approach we're taking. It remains a fluid one, but it includes continuing to uh, donate 1%, grant 1% of our revenue every year uh, to small grassroots organizations working on the type of topics I mentioned. We support them through digital tools that are intended to connect them with, with our community, which at this point is pretty large globally and, and, and very active politically. Um, and then, you know, it, it includes quite a few other things um, that are increasingly at the intersection of business, politics, and society, like trying to scale here in Europe, uh, community-based decentralized renewable energy sources, and also trying to transform our agricultural sector towards more regenerative and organic agricultural practices. So those things are they're front of mind for us. And while we cannot fund everything and move everything forward as fast as we were planning to do 90 days ago, foundationally, the things that have been our focus continue to be our focus. And, and there's no chance that we'll be moving back on that in this current environment. Many thanks. Many thanks for this uh, strong and brief, uh, brief uh, statement. And I'm, I'm sure we'll get back to some of, some of these, these points. So next we have Nicholas Fiersley. He is, uh, Nick is uh, Director General of the World's Pensions Council. And uh, he's been active in various uh, investment think tank policy fora to promote uh, ESG uh, principles. Um, for instance, um, as a member of the Board of Advisors uh, of the World ba Bank Infrastructure Facility. And um, I guess my question to Nick is, is really with regards to uh, um, long-term investment. Um, we heard earlier from Petri that this is kind of essential for uh, promoting and strengthening ESG going through 
uh, this current crisis and its economic impacts. Uh, but of course, there might be factors that avert uh, the focus on these long-term aspects because, because the crisis is, of course, a, a significant short-term shock and there's various policy measures that seem to focus attention on the short term. We discussed uh, quantitative easing yesterday. So can you maybe, from the perspective of long-term investment, comment on the kind of uh, future of ESG uh, and uh, the, the kind of policy environment in which it could or could not thrive? Right. Uh, thank you for the question. And I want to come back to basically the initial uh, two or three questions. I think that Joe asked, you know, the survey at the very beginning of the session. I think that they're very interesting because basically they showed two avenues, you know, after the crisis, you know, is it business as usual because people are so poor and, and the unemployment rate is so high and the governments are, are so, you know, depressed and um, pressed by their public opinions that they can't afford, so to speak, to spend money on, on green tree hugging because you know they have bigger fish to fry, which is basically survival. Or would it be really an SDG driven or ESG driven recovery? And, and so that's the big question. And then we should have the, the policy and investment response to that question in real time in the coming days and weeks. So, so, we, so we shall see. So, so it's going to be interesting to, to, to answer your question, basically. Uh, um, I, I'm, I'm, to make a long story short, I'm, I'm, I'm carefully optimistic. So I think I'm, I'm carefully optimistic that it will be, hopefully, to a certain extent, an ESG-driven recovery. And I'll tell you why. Uh, and I'm aware of time. So I'll tell you why. And I, I think it's because, basically, the crisis that we are going through today has very little to do in reality, in my opinion, and I'm gonna, I forgot to make a disclaimer. So everything I'm saying now is strictly a reflection of my personal opinions. And it's by, by no means uh, a reflection of any statement from the World Pension Forum or the World Pensions Council or the Singapore Economic Forum. So it's really my personal opinion, including the insults or, or uh, mistakes that I'll make. But, but basically in my personal opinion, I, I, think it's, I think the odds are that it, it could be an ESG driven recovery because the roots of the problem in my personal view have nothing to do or very little to do in reality with some exotic microbe or germ that came from the province of Hubei in central uh, China. And I think the crisis has very little to do in reality to the rivalry between the Russians and the Saudis for control of you know whatever the world economy or the oil industry. So I think all this is quite shallow. It's at the surface of things. I think. I think the reason we, where we have a crisis is we had pent up dysfunctions, so very severe pent up dysfunctions in the way our economic policy and financial and corporate finance and corporate governance system has been organized for the past 25, 35 years, and I think slowly but surely these pent up problems have come to the fore, triggered, if you will, by the COVID-19 crisis. But in reality, it, go, it goes really deeper. So what do I mean by it goes deeper? I think something very bad happened in the late 70s, early 80s. It's the triumph of the extreme form of you know, Chicago school neoliberalism. And, and those who know me know that I'm not a Bolshevik or a socialist, so my critique of the Chicago school is really a centrist or center-right critique. So, um, so the reason why I'm criticizing the excesses of the Chicago school is because I'm a center-right believer in, in entrepreneurship and free markets. And that's why I'm criticizing these excesses. And why do I think it's excessive? Because I think it contaminated a lot of things in our way of life. So it's not only financial policy or, you know, initially it was focusing only on monetary policy. And then from monetary policy, it spread to all sorts of, you know, policy uh, issues, including pensions, healthcare, and then it spread to regulation. So basically even financial regulators, not all of them, but many governments, many financial regulators, many corporate governance experts, many insurance industry regulators and policymakers, their worldview is completely determined by that Chicago school 
biases. So to make it long story short, what is the bias? If I had to summarize it, I would say short-termism. So, so you know, many people would say, oh, the Chicago school is bad because it's financialization. You know, the world has been financialized. I don't think it's a problem in itself that the world today is more financialized than 35 years ago. The real problem is short-termism. So, so clearly everything is much more short-termist, including regulation, including government policy. And the problem is, and, 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 and I join you in saying what you said at the beginning that, you know, hopefully that business round table in New York City at the end of August of 2019, hopefully could be a turning point or the beginning of a turning point. But the idea that relentlessly every quarter, the CEOs and the CFOs and the COOs of all the companies in the world, large and small, have to focus relentlessly on maximizing quarterly net earnings. So it's not, not even shareholder value because shareholder value is a vague concept. So, so it's net earnings. And so this is really the textbook definition of that Chicago school. And until August of 2019, if you met with the business round table, you know, the fine flower, the fine flower of Wall Street or American CEOs, if you talk to them until July of 2019, Anything other than that was really anathema. So, so they started to change in August. I think it's only a, the beginning and it's, it's a good beginning. And then now we have the COVID-19 or the crisis, right? So, and that crisis is from what we're hearing signals. So those people who met you know, on Wall Street like seven months ago, now in the past two, three months with the current financial crisis, Many of them are doubling down and they're saying, oh, we want more ESG, more SDG. So it's good, it's good. Part of it is PR and marketing. Part of it is true and sincere. And I think it's great if we, as you know, think tanks, think tanks, policy thinkers, civil society, board members, corporate governance experts, if we, in the coming weeks, really tell them, fantastic, you know, we, we, we love what you're saying uh, on Wall Street, but you know, show us, you know, show us the goods or show us the money. So I think it's a good time uh, to really, uh, you know, really accompany them, accompany them uh, and help them steer more capital towards ESG driven investment. And the same is true of governments. The same is true of regulators. They're saying that, you know, they're greener than do and that they all want the green recovery, especially in Europe and, and, and Canada and Asia. So let's, you know, let's hope it's true and let's really keep the pressure in the coming months to make it truly uh, an ESG driven, you know, rebirth or renaissance. What a beautiful statement. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm sure people will respond to that positively, maybe, maybe with skepticism, whatever. Uh, many thanks, Nick. So uh, we quickly turn to our next speaker, uh, Gail Clintworth. Uh, Gail held several significant managerial roles uh, in Unilever, the company she worked for for 28 years. Um, she was also group customer director and responsible, responsible business lead for all, Old Mutual. And since then, he's, uh, she's been held, uh, holding several uh, non-executive non -executive director roles, uh, among others uh, uh, at Shell Company, Tiger Brands, Globescan. Um, and so we, we bring in Gail to ask her about uh, let's say the bottom-up uh, perspective. It, it is it is clear that the virus and the protective countermeasures that have been introduced are a kind of shock to everyday life around the globe and in in various forms for uh, for those depending on day wages in India as much as for uh, people in Switzerland where I'm sitting now. Um, so. Um, their daily routines are disrupted uh, and are about, uh, have changed. Social interactions have changed or uh, or been reduced. Consumption patterns have uh, have also uh, changed. And so the question I want to ask Gail is really whether the crisis could accelerate changes in attitudes and behaviors amongst citizens and consumers, for instance, towards more local consumption, more environmental consciousness in your activities, or whether the crisis is rather returned to more basic pressing problems, 
that uh, somewhat maybe contradict these developments towards environmental consciousness, which admittedly was always maybe primarily a concern for the more well-off rather than the day wage workers in, in India. So uh, Gail, uh, thank you, the Leo. word is yours. That's great, thank you. Um, so again, disclaimer, if anyone knew what's actually going to happen, they'd be very, very wealthy today. So let me um, just uh, put that as a caveat to anything I'm going to say. I mean, the first, I'd, I'd, the first thing I'd like to say is just a, an opinion I have. And uh, it's, a, it's a, actually a quote from someone who wrote a poem. It says, they say we are at war. I think we are falling in love with the human race. They say we are at war. I think we are falling in love with the human race. And that was, a, 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 in fact, a, a little poem written by a professor of international peacekeeping at the University of Notre Dame. And why I've, I've specifically focused on that is I'm speaking, I guess, on behalf of people who are consumers and voters and all of us. Um, and I guess what is happening in society as a result of COVID is that we are all being drawn very much more to our humanity. So our humanity as um, people who are scared about our own health and those of our families and those of our communities. Secondly, people who are concerned about our, our own personal economic stability, that of our communities and that of our countries. And thirdly, people who are challenging uh, who we trust in. And, you know, I'm not going to go into any of the theory here, but anyone who understands anything about Maslow's hierarchy um, will understand that people are really going back down to, you know, what is my base security all about? And so we see that appearing in a number of ways. First of all, um, uh, on the health front, not purely worrying about COVID, but there's great awareness that there's a real distinction between people who can get health care and pay for it versus people who are really at, um, at risk, at burden of anything that might come their way. And there is that a far greater awareness because it's become so obvious that, um, you know, although we are in it together, we're really not in it together. You know, people who are saying we're all in this together, oh, no, we're not. <laughs> Quite frankly, there are uh, many more billions who are not in this together. So I think there's an awareness of that and, and that drive for greater equity, um, I believe, will is something that will be very top of mind. And you see that in the response of people and voters um, to uh, the lack of empathy and the greediness that we're seeing some corporates and some governments display. So we, we corporates have gone in and they've grabbed the first um, supply of any kind of um, uh, support mechanisms. There's a, a backlash that small business owners aren't getting it and, and quite vocal backlash. So I think that is something that, that we need to be very aware of, this, this understanding that the inequity in society is just not working, right? Secondly, that's on the health front. Secondly, um, if you just look at how people are going to worry about their future lives, right? The economic fallout of this, there might be some of us that are somewhat protected, but the very large part of society is really not protected, right? So whether we are talking about in India and Africa, you are going to lose your job, or you might not be able to even travel to get to a job, or if you're going, you can't get home from where you were employed. Um, and if you go home, are you ever going to be able to afford to come back again, right? So the, the real concern about what's going to happen after this is very significant. And, you know, I sometimes, um, I, I sometimes think to myself, I'm saying, is this going to be an ESG driven uh, recovery? is so out of touch with, I guess, where most human beings are sitting right now, which is, oh my word, am I going to survive? And then, you know, if we say to them, well, you know, give away plastic straws right now and don't do any more plastic straws, it 
kind of isn't quite in the same, uh, I guess, uh, criteria of choice, right? But what are some of the real positives that I think are happening that could drive uh, a lot of what we are talking about? So first of all, uh, uh, this awareness that there's something out of balance in the world. And, you know, whoever knows where this came from, you know, did it come from wet markets? Did it come from wherever? This uh, going back to community, going back to nature, I think is something that is, is quite deeply being driven uh, from within. And I've been listening to uh, lots of these meditations that are online at the moment that everyone, and all of them are talking about, right, we need to get back in, in touch with our source. And I'm pretty sure that there'll be some, some of that coming through. So that's pretty good. And then uh, the, the online and e-commerce uh, movement, where suddenly we're going to get far more people that not only discover um, using e-commerce and using online mechanisms in order to do their day-to-day -day business. But, you know, I was talking with uh, the, one of the companies I'm on the board of who um, is actually a supplier to Patagonia. So they're the largest South Asian apparel manufacturer. And, uh, you know, they were saying in India, we're previously uh, getting... Um, uh, goods out, so, so uh, lingerie goods out, was virtually impossible to second tier cities. You know, suddenly that mechanism is there. Now, why is that good for ESG? Because we know that in some ways, if we can crack the, um, the Amazons, et cetera, of this world, and we can crack the logistics, in some ways, we might actually be able to manage our footprint a little bit better. Um, and then lastly, I'd just like to talk about you know, where I think, where I think perhaps in, in policy, we might be able to grab hold of some of these movements in how, what people think. So the first is even before um, COVID made its ugly appearance. Um, and I want to refer to Globescan, which I'm very, which is a wonderful uh, organization that I'm, I'm fortunate to chair. Um, even before that, they do a lot of research. And what we were seeing that in terms of trust, right, scientists and NGOs are really top of the pops. 25 countries, 1,000 people surveyed in each country. Scientists and NGOs, top of the pops in terms of who we trust. I would imagine that post this, that's going to be um, even greater significance. The worst... <laughs> <laughs> are businesses, governments, and the media. Now, depending on how people are re or responding to this crisis, I think we're going to see some kind of shift in that. Um, hope, hopefully, uh, the, the, good, the good responsible citizen, uh, citizens as companies will have a better response and get even um, more confident for their push towards responsible capitalism. Secondly, uh, what was really clear is that everybody wants to make the right choices, right? Virtually everyone. So 64% of people around the world want to make the right choices. In, in uh, a healthy and sustainable living study that they've recently done, you know, 54% of people around the world want to make the right choices. But in the 16 to 24 year old bracket, 64% want to make the right choices. The main reason that they say they can't is because of a perceived cost of doing that, right? And they're saying, well, the cost is um, an issue that governments and, and businesses should sort out. Now, will post-COVID help with that? Well, you know, who knows? The one thing that I, I, I always look for the positive, right? The one thing that I was going towards was, what I see happening in a lot of the companies that I'm working with is waste is coming out. Waste is falling out, right? So, you know, where you had something in your portfolio that you're going, well, let's hang on and see. and don't. Well, actually, that's not happening anymore. You are being drastic in the way you, you cut waste out. And you're probably finding that throughout society, which is good because if we can then take that space in terms of cost and waste, 
Uh, and I'm not only talking about waste in the environmental waste side, I'm talking about waste just generally in business process and directed towards more responsible activities. That's really good. So, um, yeah, I guess what I'm saying is I've got great hope. Whatever we do, though, we mustn't think this is a moment in time because this marathon we're running is actually a long marathon. And this happens to be one station that we kind of had a little bit of a hiccup on, but there's a much longer road to go. So thank you. Thank you so much, Gail. I think on that point, you, you, you seem to agree with, with Nick, and I'm sure we are going to come back to, to that. Last but not least, we have Alexander Renoy Khan uh, as one uh, among our speakers. Um, Alexander is an academic and he holds a position as professor of economics at the University of Amsterdam but he's also very much active in the policy and political world. He, he, he was chairman of the Dutch Employers Association. He uh, was president of the Economic Advisory Council for the Dutch Parliament. And he was also himself member of the Dutch uh, Senate. Um, for Alexander, I have basically two questions. One would be uh, whether he, as an academic, I guess he, he has a kind of intellectual way of approaching this on a very principled level, whether he sees that the pandemic uh, could strengthen uh, the, the case for responsible capitalism or weaken it structurally. So that's the kind of way in which he sees the pandemic and its possible effects. And the second, of course, is realistically what policy responses we might expect and uh, the ways in which companies would feel supported or not uh, in their attempt to strengthen uh, ESG um, as part of their strategies. Uh, Alexander, are you with us? I think so. Oh, Can you hear me? Cool, yeah, it works. Okay. Well, thank you very much for that nice introduction and for the invitation to speak on this topic that is very dear to my heart and I think to many people's hearts by now. I think many of us would agree, as Joe said at the beginning, that capitalism is ready for reform. In fact, it urgently requires reform. And I think many people would also view the current crisis as further evidence to that effect. Uh, and we can, of course, debate the real causes of this crisis. I was intrigued by Nick's theory. Frankly, I think it's a little bit too much credit to neoliberalism. But whatever the reason might be, there is certainly evidence of capitalism straining at the seams. And COVID-19, to me at least, demonstrates once again the fragility and the vulnerability of our system as it stands, exacerbated by increasing imbalances between humans and the nature and environment that is around us. And that combination is an increasingly complex and toxic mix. So responsible capitalism is a very attractive uh, catchphrase to view as a possible goal for from now onwards. I would say that responsive capitalism will be the first step in the right direction, the system that at least responds to the concerns that it witnesses. And at the end of the day, respectable capitalism might be there for all of us to gain and enjoy. Companies, uh, large and small, many of us, I'm sure, know examples, view this not just as a responsibility, but also as an opportunity. An opportunity because uh, as they are increasingly realizing their employees, their customers, their bankers, and even their shareholders are expecting them to contribute to that ultimate goal. And all these stakeholders uh, have their own influence and their own power to uh, effect. And at the end of the day, what I would hope is that the Corona crisis will encourage all these stakeholders, including the shareholders, into further reflection and hopefully increased motivation to push for that kind of transformation. I would welcome that very much. Uh, and when you ask me to what extent I am optimistic about the chances here, um, I have to say that I share a certain skepticism with one of the earlier speakers about the way in which uh, the situation post corona will evolve it will evolve as the relief of business as usual 
may to some extent uh, uh, keep people away from returning to the issues that occupied them previously and that are still as urgent as ever. And so the pressure to clean up the post-corona mess may at least for a while overtake the urgency of structural reform. But at the end of the day, I would hope that uh, being an optimist myself, that reform process would take place again and accelerate. And to do that and to be successful in that transformation, it is of course clear to uh, all of us, I suppose, that the public sector has its own role to play. Its own role to play using, if you will, the carrot and the stick to encourage that responsible behavior that we all seek to encourage. Uh, and carrots and sticks we have on both sides in large numbers. Carrots, largely financial incentives. Uh, one of the important developments there are uh, thoughts about green taxation, tax and fiscal systems that encourage responsible behavior, polluter pay principles, putting that in place, uh, but also possibilities for the public sector to demand that its own suppliers satisfy high sustainability standards and set appropriate examples in that fashion. And sticks in the sense that regulations to prevent no longer acceptable forms of production or human resource management are increasingly part of the repertoire in many Western and uh, indeed non-Western economies. Ideally, I would hope that the role of the public sector uh, should be a supportive and a collaborative one. And uh, indeed, uh, there are many examples in my own country, the Netherlands and elsewhere, that working with the public and private sector jointly, forms of innovation can be realized that serve private and public goals alike uh, and jointly contribute to the sustainability targets that we are all in favor of. And in countries like the Netherlands, that kind of joint effort comes very naturally and is really part of our cultural DNA. But even there, uh, I and many others have found over the years that it's hard work to ensure that the radical reform gets its proper place on the agenda. And wherever democratic decision-making interferes, we all know that it adds layers of complexity and potential delay that we have to learn how to live with. I'm still optimistic. And one of the reasons I'm optimistic is in a development that some of the earlier speakers referred to, which is the global support that is now being extended to the SDGs, the, societal, the Sustainable Development Goals that the United Nations proposed and have adopted. The United Nations initiative that follows in the footsteps of the earlier Millennium Goals that have been surprisingly successful and that are different in the sense that the business community is now fully involved in implementing them and realizing them. And these, society, these sustainable development goals come with indicators that turn adherence to them in an issue that is certainly demanding and explicit as any could have been. And business support here, I think, is what makes it different and encouraging sustainability then becoming a core requirement for responsible behavior, both on the private and the public side. And going forward, I would hope that European business inside and outside the European Union would be willing to become an active partner in European efforts to uh, create and exercise public and private platforms to make sure sustainable behavior gets the attention it deserves. Um, one of the big challenges uh, I feel post-corona will be to come to terms with how we want to extend globalization going forward. And many of us feel, I think quite appropriately, that globalization, if only by allowing pandemics to spread so rapidly and quickly as they did, has become part of the problem and not just part of the solution. And the whole debate on strategic independence as being a desirable thing for Europe, for instance, to strive for, underlines that concern. I would hope, uh, and let, let me finish by saying that, that business realizes it has a lot to lose in that debate, and perhaps even more importantly, so do developing countries, because surely globalization has been a lifeline for them on many occasions, 
and will be going forward if only in the supply of appropriate amounts of food for them to consume in the near future. And so I would hope that an appropriate rebalancing of global trading practices can save globalization and turn it into a viable concept going forward. At the end of the day, I would hope that the sobering experience of lockdowns and the like will accelerate the move towards responsible capitalism, because at the end of the day, if we sum everything up, we know that there simply is no alternative to that as a vehicle for ongoing global prosperity. Thank you. Many, many thanks, uh, Alexander. Again, you raised many issues that we would need to discuss in depth. Uh, 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 and thanks, thanks for that. We have about 20 minutes now for, for Q&A. Um, and I can't see, uh, uh, I can't see Joe, but let me just raise maybe the first question my, myself, which is, I think, a way of reformulating Ron's question, which he posted in the chat. Um, from Petri, and of course, also from Ryan, we heard positive examples of companies very committed to stakehold to a stakeholder approach and uh, going uh, into the crisis with this strong commitment and 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 thereby also uh, adjusting their crisis response as well as their future plans to that commitment. Um, but of course, there might be negative examples. And my question is really uh, maybe first to Petri, but also to Ryan. What are the conditions under which this, these commitments can be held? Uh, do they have to do with government? Do they have to do with patient capital? The issue that Petri raised. Uh, do they have to do with the kind of management that you find in uh, corporations? Uh, what is it, or is it the thing that Ryan raised, which is that in the case of Patagonia, it's very much in the DNA of what the company is about. So I, I, I'm wondering, you know, what are the conditions uh, under which you know, this can, this can be maintained and can be strengthened as a result of the crisis and the conditions under which uh, maybe companies focus on short-termism of the kind Nick, Nick just described earlier. Maybe Petri first, if, 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 if you want. Yes, yes, I think, I think actually we, we both said uh, something similar where I phrased it as um, the, the purpose and the strength of your values going into the crisis determines the way you are going to, the way companies are addressing the crisis and the sort of choices they make in their expectations and how to recover. However, um, responding to where do you see the negative sides, uh, that, that's clearly where, where, where that may not be the case. And, and with that, with strong purpose, with strong values, comes strong leadership. That's, that's all critical. Um, and, um, um, and, and also, of course, that also goes hand in hand with uh, companies that are, that are more resilient than others. Uh, although some sectors are hit in a way that, uh, that is specific to this type of, of event, uh, generally speaking, of course, resilient companies uh, with good business models, with good uh, leadership, good culture, good values, good um, um, uh, purposes, they, they, they can come out of it, uh, generally speaking, better than the others. Uh, the, 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 the worst examples, of course, we do see and tend to see where, uh, where companies are really, really hurt and struggling um, and are in that, are in that sense, not, not so much, do not so much see the inspiration from a view of, of where they would want to come go. And as a result, the possibility to sell it. Thank, thanks. Uh, Ryan, do you want to add something on to that? Yeah, I would add quickly, you know, as I said before, you know, we're, we're in a very fortuitous position given the ownership that we have and that, you know, um, our reason for being is so aligned with, it's so integrated throughout our business that this is not a topic that we struggle with figuring out what's most important one or the other it's just deeply embedded in the organization all of that said I, you know i would add to it a couple of comments and i'm probably very much repeating the ones that were just made i, I think number one you know and i mean this it's, it's going to sound a little disrespectful perhaps and it's not my intent but 
you know, I think everybody loves the title of leader, but leadership is not something that you do when you've got a tailwind and the audience is, is, is favorable. It's, you know, it's the hard decisions that you make, however unpopular under duress. And you know, it's a well-worn sort of idea, but it's very true. And I think this environment provides a lot of that. I think the other thing is, is that the world is full of opportunities for excuses uh, to be harvested at the best of times and a global pandemic serves it up in spades. And so I think if you're looking for excuses, whether it's your ownership structure, the need to focus on quarterly results or otherwise, they're everywhere. Um, but I think the question really is, is what do you exist to do? How deep is that commitment? And even during lean times, what can you afford to continue to focus on? I think one of the things that's helped us through this period of time, despite the fact that, as I mentioned, you know, from a revenue point of view, we will go backwards in a big way this year. But wherever we land, I think a good portion of it will come from the fact that we have a body of work of standing for the things we do. And that resonates with a certain slice of, of uh, resonates with our community. And I think that that is something that you build up over time. So I do think that that also is, um, I think it's an important idea. Thank, thank you so much. So, so my next question maybe is, is more a political policy one to, to Nick as well as Alexander. So I guess my, my uh, perception is maybe I'm wrong that this is a time of divergence. You have uh, kind of China, broadly speaking, US and Europe as the major players in the world economy, uh, developing very much their own kind of um, approaches to capitalism, so to say, in terms of uh, policy. And it seems that uh, the ways in which corporations operate and the kind of support they get during the crisis very much depends on where they are located, whether they are in Europe, US, wherever. So would you agree that this is a time at which whatever responsible capitalism is or might be, the kind of specific institutional political context in which you are located is going to matter more going forward? Or do you think that uh, corporations operating globally are somewhat independent in their approach uh, from, from that. Uh, maybe, maybe Nick first and then Alexander, if you want. Nick, can you unmute? Uh, yeah. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, sorry for that. Uh, the technical glitch. Um, I think it's what's interesting now is that there are two things happening at the same time. So on the one hand, you have a rise in ISG, SDG idealism, but what's happening in parallel, practically at the same time, and it's really strange, it's a paradox, there is a rise in, in cynicism. And so, so that, that rise in, in cynicism is due to a certain extent to the renewed Sino-American rivalry. So really, we've seen that in the past few weeks and months, and it, it seems to be accelerating. That's sort of what people call a new Cold War you know, uh, pitting Washington DC against Beijing, blah, blah, blah. It's almost of a cliche. And I think, you know, it's not as much as a new Cold War as, as a natural consequence of some long-term geoeconomic trends that maybe were invisible. And people are starting to realize that these geoeconomic trends are reality. And part of that is, you know, renewed cynicism from the part of policymakers in Washington DC or, or Beijing or, some may call it realism. So, you know, one man's cynicism is another man's realism. So it, it's not necessarily bad that, you know, policymakers, after all, look at their own, you know, selfish, egoistical interest and at America first or China first or the Chinese dream or whatever you want to call it. So the thing is, you know, at least, you know, it, it, it brings clarity to the system. But what's interesting uh, to, I guess, the analyst is to see that rise in sort of nationalist, you know, egoistical feelings happening at the same time as the rise in SDG, ESG idealism from a large part of civil society and, and companies. So how can we reconcile them? So how can, can they both happen at the same time, right? And I, I really think that they can happen at the same time. So it's a paradox. And, and why do I think that it can happen at the same time? You know, I'll go back to, you know, Renaissance, Italian and French Jesuit uh, philosophers, and, and they used to say that the best kind, you know, the best kind of virtue or the fa the most efficient kind of virtue is the one that rides the horse of self-interest and cynicism. Uh, and it may sound Jesuitical and sophistic, sophistic, but I think it's true. 
So what you see in China, even amongst the CEOs of the large state-owned enterprises, so you know many of them, you know, pure uh, elite communist uh, committed, you know, bureaucrats or executives, and many of them have PhDs in coal mining or PhDs in nuclear energy. They're all embracing the ESG SDG agenda, and in many ways, some of these so-called bureaucratic, heavy industry, state-owned enterprises in Shanghai or Beijing are greener and they're more ESG oriented than similar companies in the West. So I think it, it's a good lesson for us uh, in, in Europe. So, so, so basically what I wanna say, you know, uh, and I'm aware of time is that ideally, you know, like, like shareholder capitalism itself is not the issue. Once again, you know, I, I wanna clarify what I said earlier, what I criticized is short-termism and what I criticized is the notion of externality that you, know, you can pollute and it's only an external factor. So that I'm critical of. And that's what I called the Chicago School. Shareholder capitalism in itself is very good. Uh, and and you know, Andrew, Andrew Carnegie, who is the, you know, the symbol, who was the symbol of you know, the Scottish American, you know, Robert Barron, right? The, the cynical Andrew Carnegie today he would probably invest a lot of money in renewable energy and green infrastructure, not because he likes to hug trees, but it's a very, very uh, smart thing to do from a purely self-interested financial perspective. So I think, you know, that's the hope is that, you know, in a way, many of the cynics will join the ESG or SDG bandwagon uh, out of self-interest, if not because they want to hug trees. So that's, you know, my my ray of hope or concluding uh, line. Okay. Many thanks. Alexander, do you want to comment briefly on, on this? That I agree with all these uh, assessments about shareholder capitalism, but what I do agree is that the world political scene is changing quite rapidly and that we see traditional leaders, uh, the United States first and foremost, uh, falter and fail in the natural role that was uh, entrusted to them and that they, for whatever reason, do not seem to be able to take up right now. Uh, and as bad as that is, uh, we've been through this before and on previous occasions, as well as on this one, uh, I feel that it also creates an opportunity and perhaps a responsibility for the business community that does not necessarily seek to take over that role, but that I think will be more or less forced by circumstance to consider it seriously. Uh, the example that I'm thinking of was in the early 90s when the European integration process also failed because of poor political leadership. And then the European business community took it upon themselves to push for it very, very strongly uh, and encourage Jacques Delors, the then European president, to take up that call. And as the result of that, uh, at the end of the day, European integration it created a huge opportunity for the business community itself and for the political communities behind it. And right now, I think we may be living through a similar period. And so I would hope that, for instance, through that vehicle of the SDGs, the business community can work and unite behind these big structural themes and view it as opportunities for new forms of collaboration between public and private structure players, structure powers, to work together for goals that make global sense. And if the political leaders fail to carry out that message effectively, then private leaders have to step in and do better than they did. And that is what we may be seeing the first signs of and that we might see more of post corona if circumstances permit. M many thanks. Um, so um, of course the, the, the chat has been very active and I want to uh, take new two questions uh, from from the chat, which I think relate to spe specific features that uh, that belong to responsible capitalism. So, so one question is about um, the circular economy and what role the circular economy is going to play uh, in the future in responsible capitalism. That's from Sarah, and then Ismail uh, Ertuk, uh, another fellow senior fellow from Radix, asks whether we should see the emergence of new corporate forms, new forms of ownership as a result of the uh, corona crisis um, uh, 
and going forward. Uh, maybe Gail, can you can you say something about these issues? All right. Well, let's let's just start with uh, circular economy. Um, absolutely critical, right? And why is that? Because at the end of the day, I'm sorry. Can you turn on your video, Gail? Oh, okay. You want to see me too? <laughs> there we go. Absolutely critical because what we know in circular economy and and you know, let's think about this beyond uh, just um, taking a material and keeping it in, in circulation forever, is the most critical um, benefit of circular economy is cost saving, right? So um, I, I will share one of the, one of the little um, passion projects I'm working on at the moment is trying to uh, use these, whether we call it industrial clusters, special economic zones, et cetera, as proof points for how we can get a circular economy going in a way that can both deliver against the SDGs outside of their locality, as well as inside, and secondly, employ circular economy principles within. Um, and you know, to, to, to try and use an example, um, probably look at the Dutch food valley or look at, um, um, some of the ports that are extremely well developed, they are able to do that. But in many parts of the world, and we know we have 5,000 of these special economic zones or localities or industrial clusters in the world, they are completely left out of this discussion about the SDGs or about circular economy. So if we can drive that really hard, I think it's a, um, it's a low hanging fruit we could drive, which is a passion of mine. The, the, the second um, thought around, you know, um, I guess how much can be driven individually versus how much needs to be driven by, um, by legislation. We need it all, right? <laughs> so of course we need legislation. Of course you need the guidelines. Of course you need that. I mean, I, I have to tell you, like many of you, I've been trying to work within business for my whole life, trying to use business as a drive for what, what just makes common sense to, to deliver against uh, society's needs. And, you know, sometimes I get extremely disillusioned, particularly when I go through my bookcase. And I was actually showing some of my sons today, some, some of the, you know, I've got the end of poverty as we know it, uh, the future of capitalism, the WWF case studies, the, I have got reports and books that have been written for the last, I don't know, 25 years, right? and drives me mad. So we need the legislation, of course we do, but we also need to get us all working on trying to make some real things happen out there. So yes, we need legislation, but we all need to basically get moving into action. Th thanks, Gail. That was a very nice note to, to end. Uh, I, I'll pass on to Joe because we just have five minutes left. And I'm not sure whether we can take one more question or whether you want to uh, rather run another survey, Joe. Why don't we take one more question and then we'll run the polls. Do, do you have one uh, <coughs> from the chat? From the chat? Yes. So, so there's uh, there's plenty of commentary here. Um, you know, uh, mainly about globalization that Gail has raised. That globalization should not be about squeezing your suppliers to leave them with just two cents on the dollar, and that's one of the perversions of the modern version of of um, of globalization. That it's not about um, that it's not about comparative advantage anymore, it's about cost cutting. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, Ismail, I think, made some comments about the fact that these a certain mindset and approach to life is, is inculcated from young ages by MBA, uh, you know, in MBA students and whatever, that I think is starting to change. Um, but uh, one question from Richard is whether any of any significant and a significant pace progress along all of this is really possible without regulatory or other government intervention. 
shall we shall we pass this to to Alexander for for a final yeah. comment and then and then you can... <clears throat> formulate it in this fashion it's almost a rhetorical question um, and the answer is obviously no but I think the challenge is not so much to encourage governments to regulate which they're happy to do but to make sure that appropriate cooperative structures are in place that unite government purposes with private goals to make it worthwhile for private companies to pursue these global goals is i think the great challenge and what i would hope is that again the sdgs that so many people have commented favorably upon could play a role in uniting these public and private efforts and bring the whole world to a better situation than it currently finds itself in thanks thanks uh, joe yeah your final comments and maybe in the survey well first of all i want to thank everybody but uh, let's run um Let's run the poll that we ran first, and I'll, we had some uh, comments uh, about the poll, but um, anyway, um, now that we've heard what, uh, what everybody has had to say, let's see if we've uh, got some uh, different responses. People are thinking about it clearly. Okay, very good. I'll uh, run the second poll again. Very good. Let's uh, compare the polls. So when we started, there was a, a majority who believed that business and investors will emerge so damaged that they'll double down on uh, generating financial return. Not a huge majority, but a majority. Um, how did that change, if anything? Well, uh, it looks like we've persuaded some people. Um, so things have uh, things have moved to sixty four percent, seeing that there'll be uh, more interest. So well done to the panel. Um, we'll see if it bears out in real life. Um, it was a random sample of participants and we had a control group and so we could <laughs> there speaks the academic <laughs> um, this is the starting point that the winning was there'll be opportunity to introduce policy initiatives around responsible capitalism if handled um, sensitively with 47 percent um, and afterwards Not much change. In fact, very little change at all. Um, so it seems it seems that at the end of this process, we believe that there are opportunities at the policy level uh, if handled well. So that gives us something to do at Radix. That's good, um, and that people are more optimistic about um, a resumed focus on responsible capitalism uh, than they were when they started. Um, two final uh, things I'd like to uh, say before uh, we go. Um, the first is that uh, from our UK uh, group, 
Uh, next Monday, we're having a, um, another uh, web event, an online event on the future of UK-China relations. And we have um, a very interesting group of people. I'm just moderating, but everybody else is very interesting. So, uh, so if you'd like to watch that, to, to, to join that, uh, it's on the UK website uh, on, on the URL that you mentioned, that I mentioned there. Um, again, thank you very much everybody for participating. And I'd like to leave you with a short video, which I think, which is very cute and which I think that many will enjoy. Um, so this is our goodbye. Thank you very much. And if this video is only four minutes. I would, um, you know, it's, it's enjoyable. Thank you all. So the point is that we will like the world outside more when it's less polluted, but it is. All right. I've just come off a call talking about, and you'll be interested in this, a responsible capitalism. I know you're fascinated by it and read a lot about it. Oh, and that's why I watched it, because I thought you'd be interested. Anyway, how are you? Are you the best you've ever been? Thank you, everybody. Oh, somebody just said thank you.
Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Bye. See you soon. Bye.